if you want to prepare a meal for the men or if you want to prepare a meal for the ladies, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Um, uh, October is blank, but we do have someone for October, okay? But, but uh, um, it's blank, so don't go put your name on October, but there's other months. Glory to God. The Word Cure Healing Center is open tomorrow at 2 p.m., so if you know someone that's in need of healing or you just want to build your own faith along the lines of healing, Amen. it's good to build up your faith along those lines. Don't wait till you need healing to build up faith in healing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Amen. And so one of the craziest things that you will ever hear about is that someone will not go to a healing meeting or a healing service because they don't feel good. That is crazy right there because uh, that's where you get to feel better Amen. is at that service. So if you know somebody or know somebody that knows somebody or you just want to build up your own faith, join us tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Now next Sunday is Holy Ghost Night. All right? So it's right on us again. Next Sunday. So next Sunday night, uh, plan on being here at 6 o'clock. I believe we'll pick up exactly where we left off at the last Holy Ghost night. But we're expecting manifestations of the Spirit, aren't we? Amen. Amen. If God is real and His Word is real, then we should have exactly the same things that were in the Word of God, shouldn't we? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Some people are worried that will scare people off. I I'm not worried about that. I find that the fake and the phony scares more people than the real and the profound. Amen. Amen. So we're not going to worry about that. That is just a no hard, no holds bar service for the Lord. Well, we could just go after Thank God together. Amen, amen. And then uh, this was Children's Teachers and Helpers Appreciation Month. And, and uh, the end of the month is tomorrow. So teachers, if you if we we have a lot of teachers missing, but if you're here, you're a teacher, you want to take your basket, take it on. You can take it tonight. And uh, unless there's somebody that's sitting here and you had fourteen one hundred dollar bills and you're fixing to go hit the baskets, I'm sure they'll wait on you. Okay, and you just get out of here before everybody with your fourteen hundred dollar bills, and the teachers will just wait. They they are very patient like that. <laughs> very patient. No way. No way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah night candy. Say, what in the world is hallelujah night candy? It must be some kind of blessed uh, candy that couldn't possibly give any cavities. No, it is regular candy. <laughs> it's regular candy, but it's for hallelujah night. And so please bring a bag of candy. If you go to the store to get some milk, get a bag of candy. If you go to, uh, I, I do online orders. How many do online orders? Oh, only one other person has seen the light on that. Amen. Well, all right. Only Michael and I have, have revelation into that. But I'm telling you, I'll keep it as too. I'm telling you, it'll save you an hour of your life, at least. At least. Once a month, we used to wander around uh, Walmart after wandering around Sam's. We'd wander around Sam's for about an hour. Then we'd go wander around Walmart for two hours because we get paid once a month. And so that's a pretty that's a pretty big bill, you know. And uh, Wow. Now we don't do that. We do that online and boom. All right, so all I'm saying is if you go to Walmart for anything or do an online order, put some candy on that. Up. Kiva, put candy on your online order when you do your order. Okay, all right, all right. Make sure you bring some candy in. And then also, if you can help out with your car, if you can help out by parking your car at a specific location that we'll tell you about on that night, and you can sit in your trunk or you can sit beside your trunk in a chair that you've brought, or you can sit on the ground like a crazy hippie, whatever you want to do. You know, maybe you're dressing up as a crazy hippie that night. Then you need to sit crisscross applesauce with bare feet. That's what you need to do. And because uh, uh, that way you'll look more like a hippie. Okay? But however you sit, we need some people to come sit. And you hand out candy. And kids are going to come to you. And they'll want candy. And you can give them candy. All right? That sounds worthwhile, doesn't it? Amen. 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 We're also giving away some Bibles. We're giving away some Bibles, and we're also giving away some tracks. And so we're giving away the um, candy, but we're also giving away the gospel. Hallelujah. And then one more announcement, I think. And that is be sure to go by the bookstore and pick up free mini books. Okay. I think there are, uh, I want to say 11 or 12 
free mini books that are available, okay? Now, it's any of the mini books that are in there, but 12 are free. And again, this has happened a couple of weeks ago that somebody's, uh, when they were half price, said, I want to pay for 60 people to just go by and get a free mini book. So, if that is you, make sure you get one of those mini books. You know what time it is right now? Christmas. Investment time. Investment time. Amen. Praise God. <coughs> Hallelujah. Are you ready to give into the Lord? Amen. Amen. Well, our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, doesn't he? That's right. Amen. God has all the silver and gold, doesn't he? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, we are well able to give, aren't we? Amen. Praise God. Let's give thanks, Father. We thank you. What a privilege to give into your kingdom. We thank you, God, that the needs of this church are met. We thank you that the finances this church needs are coming in. Thank you, Lord, the enemy had to take his hand off of these finances. We thank you, Father, that your ministering spirits are going on now and bringing it in, causing it to come. Thank you, Lord God, for these that have contributed, for these that are standing with this church, standing with this ministry, taking part, taking part in this glorious gospel. Thank you, Father, that as they give, they are blessed and it's given back to them. Good measure, shaking together and running over to men, give into their bosom. And I thank you, God, and we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. After you give, stand back up. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know that there is peace within your prayer. Speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break.
that again and just go through that scripture again we did last week. Then I'm also going to look at some reasons why, if we get to it, why I do believe there will be a rapture of the church that precedes, either precedes the tribulation, or I could I could go along with the tribulation starts and then the rapture. But but uh, I'm fully convinced that the worst part of the tribulation, which is tribulation being seven years, the worst part of it will be the last three and a half years that the Christians, those who were saved before it began, will not be here for that. Will not be here for that. And uh, so, but let's uh, first of all read. Um, okay. You know what? We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Let, uh, we'll, we'll do that now. Turn to Genesis, the book of beginnings. Turn to Genesis. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4. We're going to come back to this. We'll, we'll, we'll do that other first. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process, one way to say that is uh, uh, Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a rancher. All right? That's one way to say it. Now, I had, now uh, the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. So he's bringing of the fruit of the ground, some of the harvest, bringing it in. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Okay? And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect, say, so did not respect. He did not respect. He did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should roll over. Now, there's a point to this in talking about the rapture, but I'll say this right now. That many people today, many people today are like Cain and just want to ple think that they please the Lord with whatever they want to please the Lord with. People today, Christians, people who have been born again today, will say, well, I'm going to do it this way, and, and God God knows, God understands, God, hey, do you think he knew and understood Cain? Yeah. Yeah. He knew Cain, yeah. he understood Cain, and he said, Cain, if you do it right, it'll go good with you. you, bet. you but bet. if you don't do it right, sin lies at the door. Well, the Bible says God didn't change. So even today, there are people who say, well, you know, I, I know what the Bible says, but I'm, you know. God's not pleased with that. You're not the exception to the rule. Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you want to know what God wants and what God's pleased with, all you have to do is open the book. Amen. Amen. You'll also find out what he does not like and what he's not pleased with and what he has not ordained. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, we have an enemy. We have a devil. There is a devil. We don't have it, but there is a devil, and he tries to deceive us, and he tries to get us off God's perfect plan and will for our lives. Why in the world would he do that? Because he does not want, mm -hmm. does not want men to be saved, does not want men to serve the Lord their God. Hallelujah. Right. Oh, my. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and his desire is for you. But you should rule over it. So even then, even without Jesus having died on the cross, there God is telling Cain, you should rule over sin. Amen. See, the devil wants to tell you you can't help yourself. Yeah. The devil wants to tell you you were born like that. There's no way you could not sin. But God says you should rule over it. Amen. Amen. See, we've become such a society of, of being undisciplined that we have young people running around Thinking that they can't help themselves. Well, I was born this way, or I was born that way, or I have to do this, or I have to do this. No, that's a lie from Satan. Amen. You can rule over that. You can be the boss, that's what rule is. You can be the boss of that. Amen. You can have discipline. Now, Cain, and you know discipline... It's taught on some level, even in our schools, especially if you ever go into athletics, discipline's taught in it. Yes. Because you don't you don't want, usually, to get up and run. Somebody always likes getting up and run. Wait a minute. You just it's always it's just a joy. It's 
So Joy, you Victoria? No, you didn't. No, huh? You know, like, you know that might be some days, but I guarantee you, there's some days that Victoria does not want to get up and run. Or some days that is not her joy. That is not her, not her thing. You know, I, I, I can talk about football and football practice. And you know, uh, yeah, I love to play the sport. I love for game day. But do I want to do up downs? No, not really. Actually, not at all. <laughs> you know, do I want to do any of those other dumb exercises? Not really. It's a stretch, just a stretch. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to stretch so I don't cramp or hurt my back. You know, other than that, I probably wouldn't even do that. I noticed that once I got into college, once I got into my mid twenties, I was I was playing racquetball. Once I got into my mid twenties. It suddenly started affecting my body where, it, where if I had stretched or not. So that's pretty interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> Before then, you know, I just go cold, just you know, ten degrees outside. Wake up out of bed, you know, go throw the ball, go tackle somebody. It's okay, everything's feeling good. But when I got into those mid twenties, you don't stretch, you're gonna break down. Something's gonna hurt. It's gonna pop. It's gonna pull. <laughs> but that's not always a joy, is it? You know, those of you that, that are watching your weight, or, you know, those of you that are watching other people's weight, whatever you're doing. <laughs> you know, if you ever go on a diet, that's not a joy. No, that, no, that, that didn't feel great. And, you know, I dare say, looking in this room, everybody in this room <laughs> works. Everybody in this room works. Everybody goes to work. And I know, I know that you don't always like, ooh, I can't wait to get to work. Ooh, yeah, I'm tired of sleeping. I wish I could just go to work. You know, I wish I didn't have to even finish drinking this whole cup of coffee. I wish I could just go to work right now. Huh? And sitting there on the chair, reading my Bible. Woo, can't wait to get through reading my Bible, because then I get to go to work. Oh, can't wait for this shower to be over. Can't wait to stop shaving, because then I go to work. <laughs> huh? No. I mean, there's sometimes, maybe, maybe, you know, Patty probably likes going to work that much. She just got promoted. She's probably <laughs> learned to get there a while, you know. But, you know, other people, they're like, oh, uh huh. I don't know if I'm going to go to work today. It's called a discipline, isn't it? Yeah. You can discipline yourself to do things you don't want to do. Well, you know, uh, ruling over sin is a discipline. You bet. Yes. It's a discipline that you'll get better at if you practice it. But if you don't practice it, you won't get better at it and you won't be any good at it. That's right. Oh, somebody should say amen. Either amen or oh me. One of those. Amen. <laughs> amen. Verse Verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. That's a good brother, isn't it? Verse 9, <laughs> Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, Why have you, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, hold your place there. And if you're looking digitally, that's impossible. But hold your place there, and then go over to Hebrews 11. We're going to keep going back and forth. So now, Hebrews 11, verse 4. Hebrews 11, 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God's testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. That's what God said, right? The, the blood of Abel speaks to me. The blood of Abel cries out to me, right? Here it says he was righteous. Now go back to Genesis, but look at Genesis 5. Genesis 5, verse 21. 5, 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Now, how many of you have kids here tonight? Anybody have kids? You got kids? How, how many of you had your first one at 65? No? Okay, all right. So this, this is different. This is different, isn't it? It wasn't different then. I mean, some of these people are waiting into their hundreds to have to have kids. Uh, uh, Noah, for, for instance, was 500, you know, when he uh, had his three boys. 
All right, so uh, that's wow. interesting. Anyways, so Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. After he could begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So Methuselah was the only person, only kiddo he had. He lived another 300 years and had sons and daughters. But look at here, it says Enoch walked with God. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Amen. Took him. Enoch never died. God took him. Took him right into heaven. Amen. All right, now go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 5 this time. Hebrews 11, 5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken away, so he, that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Enoch had faith in God. Enoch had faith that God is a rewarder. And God rewarded Enoch and God took Enoch, right? Amen. Back to Genesis 5. We'll do Genesis 5 and Genesis 6. Genesis 5, the last verse, verse 32. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now look at chapter 6. Genesis 6, verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a, what kind of man? Just. He was a just man. He was a just man. Perfect in his generations. But you know that word perfect when looking at it in the Greek? means mature, mature, spiritually, perfect in his generations. It, it means in his generations, better than anybody else. Better than anybody. He was just before God. He wanted to please God. And he was the best. Okay? You understand that? Not everybody, he was the best. And the best, this is God recording, the best was the one who wanted to serve God. Amen. We read last week about the days of Noah and how horrible and violent those days were. Horrible and violent. Violence as has not been seen yet was in that days. Now, uh, sometimes uh, I'll think of uh, violence. I'll think of violence in one of these third world countries where everybody's always killing everybody, killing everybody for food, killing for this, killing for that. Sounds a little bit like, like New York, but I'm talking about a third world country. City, not state. <laughs> or San Francisco, you know, yeah. you can never get anybody off the street to killing each other. But we di digest it. Okay. Anyways, um, perfect, perfect as generations in a corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. I think of the old West days, the old West days. You know, in the old West days, where people were going out west and they were moving their train out west. You know, we had some Chinese immigrants putting the railroad track down. The more railroad track would go down, the train could go further west, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. But the thing about it was, you not only had what, what they called at that time Indians, because Columbus named them that, and I really don't care if it's politically correct or not. When I was a kid, I played cowboys and Indians, and so if, if you're Cherokee or something like that, don't be mad at me, just be all right, okay? <laughs> so, but they had to worry about some that, that, that weren't doing good, right? And, of course, our, our, our country wasn't doing good by them for the most part. And, you know, we'd make these little packs with them, and then somebody would break the pack. And, actually, one tribe would get with the cavalry and say, well, we're going to join you, and we're going to be against this tribe. And so just when they thought that they were all against this tribe, then this tribe would come behind them and get with the cavalry and say, no, let's secretly uh, become one and us join each other, and then we'll really be against them, but they won't know it because they'll think you're with them. And, you know, people were killing each other and acting silly all kinds of directions, you know. But then there were people who had gone out west for gold, and they were killing each other for gold. Uh, I, I mean, all kinds of people uh, went by horseback to California in, in, in hopes that they were going to become rich. And so they were panning for gold, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of cities established in California of uh, people panning gold, people trying to find gold. Well, they were killing each other. And then you just had people who were just, you know, they, they were just going to be robbers, weren't they? 
They were just going to be thieves and murderers. And they were trying to take advantage of everybody's situation. They were trying to take advantage that it wasn't heavily populated. And because it wasn't heavily populated, there wasn't a lot of law in control. And because there wasn't a lot of law in control, some of the farmers, some of the people that were going out to make a living couldn't really do anything against somebody that really knew how to shoot and came and would shoot them and take their money. That makes sense too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That was, it, it was, you could say that in the Old West, it was kind of violent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was kind of violent, all right? It doesn't compare to the days of Noah. Doesn't even hold a candle. Doesn't hold a candle. Even Sodom and Gomorrah, as corrupt as, as the Twin Cities were, and, and, and as God could not find ten righteous there, you have to know, God couldn't find ten righteous there, but he only found one in the days of Noah in all the earth. And there are millions of people that had populated the earth at that time. Millions of people. Just in all his ways. So in verse 13, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with what? Violence. Violence. The earth is filled with violence. You know, sometimes people will think, well, the world gets confused, don't they? People that don't know God get very confused about God. They'll talk about the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, and they're just completely confused. They think it's two separate gods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They think in the Old Testament he wasn't full of mercy and grace, when actually he was. Amen. Full of a lot of mercy and full of a lot of grace. Yes. Amen, amen. Uh, I mean, you just go through the Old Testament and find how many people he had no covenant at all with that came before him and asked him for something and he gave it to them. Yeah. And they weren't even his covenant people. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So God's always been full of mercy, always full of grace. You say, well, why didn't he have, them, why didn't he have the, uh, uh, the Hebrew children come in and kill the Canaanites, the Amalekites, the whatever other kites, the flagger kites? <laughs> <laughs> it's determined. You don't know how bad those people were. Yeah. Those people, I, I can't even go into spiritually what was going on there. But, but the enemy himself was trying to keep the Messiah from coming forth. Those people, they would, they would sacrifice kids. Put their kids through fire, make them walk on coals, burn them, carve up their son or carve up their daughter in the name of whatever God they were serving that year. And God said, end them, end them. Don't, don't make any kind of treaty with them. Don't let them live, end them them. Don't take a wife out of their camp and don't give your daughters to any of them. End them. Why is he doing that? Because he's ruthless? No. His mercy on the earth. His mercy on the earth. Amen. God hates violence. Yeah. After Noah came out of the ark, what was one of the first commandments? God told Noah, he said, blood for blood. You kill somebody, you need to be killed. That's, that's what God told Noah. Why did he tell him? A deterrent. A deterrent. A deterrent. You know what a deterrent is? A deterrent is supposed to stop something. It's supposed to stop it. It's supposed to stop people. Say, no, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. If I take a life, somebody will take my life. I can't. I, and I really want to kill that person because I'm really mad at them, but I can't kill them because then I'm going to die. Could you see how that would work? Mm -hmm. Can you see how sitting on death row for 30 years does not work? Yes. Yes. All right, Hebrews 11. Go back to Hebrews 11. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which according to faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you remember what this period is? Can anybody tell me? This period of time. After the fall of man, after man after Adam was kicked out of the garden, until the ark. The age of Huh? Not the age of law. No, it was the word law. Government. Conscience. 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 In this age of conscience, in Genesis, the book of beginnings, only three men are talked about being just or righteous. I just mentioned it. Abel. Enoch, no. In the New Testament, out of the age of conscience, only three men are talked about as being full of faith in that era. 
Abel, Enoch, Noah. I believe it must have been the only men. In that, how, how long was that? 1,600 years, something like that? I believe uh -huh. that was the only three men that even attempted to serve the Lord during that time. Man, that's crazy. And so, I find that those three men had something in common. All those three men got to escape the world in which they lived. All three of them. Amen. The only three just men living in the most violent time of the earth's history since man, the only three men mentioned as being just all got to escape their earth at that time. All three got to escape what was going on. Abel, not by choice, Cain killed him. But he was righteous, so yeah. we know he escaped you bet. and is in heaven today. Enoch, God just plucked him out. You bet. Amen, amen. He didn't even die. God just whoop, took him. Noah, he got to build an ark and start new people through his family, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you know, that's... You, God has patterns because he didn't change. Amen. He has patterns because he didn't change. I'm not saying you could build a doctrine on that, but isn't that an interesting pattern? As we look towards the rapture of the church, realizing that God always saves his people amen. before it gets to its worst condition. Amen, amen, amen. Takes them right out of the circumstance, doesn't he? Amen, amen. Takes them right out. Cain was, Abel was taken out because of Cain. Enoch was taken out because he just pleased God. And God took him away from everything else. Noah got taken out. Got to be the only, uh, he got to be put on the ark with his family to replenish the earth again. Hallelujah. Amen. If I were looking at patterns, I would say absolutely the church has to get raptured before things get tough. Amen. Bye -bye. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Isn't that interesting? Amen. 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 All right. Now let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. I wanted to share that and then wound up sharing it first, but that's okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Amen. Did you answer one question? Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I'm going to answer this one question. If anybody else has a question, see me right after we're done. Yes, sir. I, what, did, what did Cain not do? Why was God not pleased with Cain? Adam and Eve, when, after they sinned, they decided they could use leaves. They decided they could use plant life and cover themselves. And so it did cover themselves. But it covered themselves with a the lack of blood. God came on the scene and God did the first animal slaying and killed animals and made them animal skins from that. Cain is reverting back to Adam and Eve's decision that uh, a sacrifice of plants would be acceptable and would be enough. And, and I believe he knew better. But God for sure gave him another chance by saying, if you do right, you know, I'm accepting this. This is an animal sacrifice because it points to a human sacrifice. You know, I'm accepting it. It's blood. Jesus. It's blood. Jesus. And life is in the blood. And you're giving me a cross. And so he didn't change. Instead, he went and apparently argued with his brother Abel about it until it got heated, and then he decided to kill him. So he could have traded crops for. Oh yeah, yeah. Family. Oh yeah. Like the, oh, he could have traded with him or gone out and found one somewhere and killed it. Like in the temple later on, people would go buy. Yeah. Sacrifice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 They sure would. You no, know, in fact, if you look at the genealogy. It's a tell sign if you look at the genealogy of Noah. What was his, let's see, is it Lamech? I don't know, if you look at his genealogy. 
you will find that um, that uh, um, it was said right before us in Genesis 5. We will go ahead and turn there. Turn to Genesis 5. So Lamech lived 180 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah. Lamech was Noah's dad. But listen to what he said here. This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Their focus in this time period especially is not in any way serving God, is not in any way finding out what does God want, what, why are we here, what would God have us do. Their entire focus, and they, in this, this period of time, um, you look at the early 1900s, late 18, early 1900s, and you think of all the inventions. This time had even more inventions than then. They were constantly thinking of ways to try to ease the curse. That was their whole concern. Not, not how do we please God now? What has God said we could get to? What is our purpose? Their whole mind frame was the curse. Living within the walls of the curse. And that has become the mind frame even today. Where people are more concerned with being comfortable than being right. How can I be comfortable in this world the way things are instead of changing the world? So the mind frame today, you can already see is reverting back to that mind frame. Yeah. Wow. That, that was the whole great thing about Noah. Maybe he'll help us with the curse. He'll be the one to help us with the curse. Yeah. 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 Good question. Guys, we could keep going with that. That's, that's really good. Uh, I'll, I'll be up here after we're done if anybody else has a question. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant. Well, that tells a lot right there, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Paul said that more than once. And I believe, of course, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But you have to look at that and say, you know, there's some things God wants me to know. Amen. 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 Ignorance is not a bad word. It just means without knowledge. That's right. I'm very ignorant when it comes to mechanics and motors and things like that. Very ignorant of that. Uh, I, I just am. I hadn't learned any, any of that. And, and you know, I, I changed spark plugs once, but I forgot how I did that. I only did it one time, and that was with somebody else. I don't remember how to do that. I've changed the oil on a car a couple of times. I don't remember how to do that. It became cheaper to take it somewhere to have a change than to have to buy the right wrench and the filter and all the oil and get underneath the car and, you know, and then have to dispose of the oil and find a fire station. You could drop the oil. You might know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Bunch of nonsense. It's easier to go to Walmart and say, hey, can you change the oil in my car? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm very ignorant of that stuff. You only do it once or twice, and you don't do it for a lot of years, you probably don't remember how to do it. So, you know, some of y'all maybe have a didactic memory. But Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. We know that means dead, don't we? In our language, dead, in God's language, being separated from Him is real death. Mm -hmm. Leaving your body is not death, according to God. Right? right? So he calls it falling asleep because the body's of no use anymore at that time. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And we talked about that. I tell you, I remember when my grandfather died. When my grandfather passed away, I, I, I was <coughs> drunk for a very long time. Very long time. Just tried to ease the pain. Ease the pain, you know. Because I was living, I was living for the world. I was living like the devil. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I sorrowed with no hope. No hope. But then when my grandmother passed away, oh, just maybe cried a little bit. Didn't, didn't, didn't stay up late at night thinking about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I was still sad, but I wasn't sorrowing like people with no hope. Can you see that? Yeah. But that's what he said. Don't sorrow like people who have no hope. If you don't have God, you have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. There's going to be some people, right? There's going to be some people that never die. Mm -hmm. 
Just like Enoch didn't die. Just like Elijah didn't die. There's going to be some people that don't die. <laughs> Why? Because the church, I'm talking about Christians, because the church will be raptured. Well, even other people too, if they'll make it through the tribulation, you know, and, and you know, unfortunately, they don't have to go to hell. But I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about people who believe in the heart and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, man, I hope it's in our lifetime. I really do. I hope it's in our lifetime. Well, what happens to them? Let's go on reading. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who were saved, their bodies are in the ground. Their spirit's going to re-enter that body. That body's going to be reformed. And I used to not be able to picture that. I used to be like, huh, how, you know, is it going to be a totally different body that just comes to you? How is that going to come back together? Well, how did it come back together in Genesis? God put that dirt together, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what happens to a body after it decays? What's it going to do? Oh. I wonder if the same guy could put it back together again. Amen. Oh, yeah. And it no matter where it is, could be in the deepest part of the ocean. He can still put it back together. Amen. He knows where every piece of DNA, DNA is. Well, I almost said it like... Like in the cartoon. <laughs> dinner. <laughs> he knows where all the dinner is. <laughs> he knows where the DNA is. If you don't watch cartoons, you have no idea where I'm going. <laughs> Bless your hearts. I don't even remember what movie that is. Anybody know? Uh, oh, it's Utopia. Who said it? There we go. It's Utopia. Thank you, Patty. Utopia. Finally, I found someone as young as me here. Amen. <laughs> dinner. <laughs> Amen. For the Lord himself will descend. The Lord's coming, not all the way down. Not all the way down. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Do you know that those who have died are already with the Lord in spirit? You bet. Yes. You bet. But see, our bodies are going to be changed, aren't they? The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye. So well, what is a twinkling of an eye? It's pretty fast. Fast, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You're blinking? It's, it's pretty fast, pretty fast. Pretty fast, glory to God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.8, or just let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 5.8, it says, We are confident, yes, well, pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. There, there ain't no, there's no purgatory. There's no halfway mark. There's no, there's no haunting anybody. If you're saved, you go to be with the Lord. The Amen. Your spirit, Amen. the inside, the, the inward man goes right, goes right up, goes right up. Until the time of the rapture of the church, then it's going to come back in the body that's reformed, and then we're all going to meet together in the air. That's where we're meeting. We're going to meet together in the air, and these bodies are going to be changed, aren't they? Amen. Corruption is going to put on in corruption. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Verse 37. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men. That's the one you're wearing. That's the one you're wearing. Hallelujah. Yeah. You will even even if you die before the rapture of the church and you go up, your spirit goes up to be with the Lord, you will have flesh again. It'll be glorified though. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Glorified flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies. That's a glorified body. That's the one you'll have. And terrestrial bodies. That's the one you have now. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. 
So, is, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in natural body, it's raised to what kind of body? Spiritual. A spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last... Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of what? Dust. dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are all those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born, the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Who's it talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. That means everybody's not going to die, but we shall be changed. Amen. That means we're all going to be changed. Whether you're here in the rapture of the church and you get raptured, or whether your body dies before the rapture of the church, you're still getting a new body. Amen. You're still going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to be changed. Lord. If you die before the rapture of the church, your body's coming back together. You're going back into that body. That body's going to meet the others in the air. And in a twinkling of an eye, as fast as you could spit, you're going to have a glorified body. Amen. That's actually faster than you can spit. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me tell you one glimpse we have of the resurrected body, the glorified body. And then we'll go. And we'll, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll look at some scriptures next week on that glorified body. One. One glimpse that you have the glorified body is to look at the glorified body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'll be changed into his image. Amen. You bet. You Amen. bet. Amen. Isn't, isn't he the first fruits you bet. of the resurrection? You bet. Amen. So you say, well, what would my glorified body be looked at? Well, look at the glorified body of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You look at the glorified body of Jesus, and Jesus was appearing and disappearing in front of people. You look at the glorified body of Jesus, and Jesus is walking through doors. Amen. 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 You look at the glorified body of Jesus, and Jesus was walking at the speed of spirit. Jesus would be in Jerusalem and then be in Galilee. How? Because he's going at the speed of spirit. Amen. Amen. Ooh, the glorified body is going to be pretty cool. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. No wonder they wrote songs like, what a day that will be. Amen. Then my Amen. Jesus I shall see. What a day. What a glorious day. That, that will be. be. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory to God. Glory. Well, I'm going to straighten that out. I'm going to be lost next week. Praise God. Hey, let's just give you a phrase before we go. Heavenly Father, thank you. You're an amazing God. You're a wonderful God. We love you, Lord. We worship you, God. We thank you, Father. We look forward. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We look forward to the resurrection. We look forward. We look forward to the rapture of the church. Bodies coming up, meeting bodies, meeting others in the air. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for every change we shall all be. Amen. We give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You're just me.